Oh, good job. អង្គជាមញ្ចប្រាស់ប្រកាសបន្តតែចំណាកាន <coughs> Đào ảnh sáng là rìa cao bị dự thân là phép vật tầm miền, áo vật tầm miền, phía kỳ nâng bộ cố đại ảnh dùm đẹp, có hỏi chứa nhìn cho rùm được nông kênh tầm đại ca, xạm đại ca thay mình. Xô mà khôn lục thiến, nếu nông xạm đại ca này thay mình, rùm phía kỳ tầm ảnh này đường cơ đây miền vật tầm miền. Tại lại, chôn chôn chọn nông chí, miền vật tầm miền vì mình tục khôn khôn khăn 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 សាក់សៃលោកស្ទីហ្វិនហេដឺដែលត្រូវប្រើសេចក្តីការបន្តនៅថ្ងៃនេះមានវត្តមាននៃ <coughs> Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honours. May it please you. Good morning to my fellow council. Good morning to you, Mr. Header. Mr. President, can I please ask two things? Firstly, that the four files that Mr. Header was dealing with last Thursday now be handed back to him. And secondly, that he be handed a new file 5. And I have here, Mr. President, a number of copies of the index to file 5 for distribution in the courtroom. Oui, bonjour Monsieur le Président, bonjour à l'ensemble de la Chambre, bonjour également à l'ensemble de mes confrères et partis. Simplement, je ne sais pas encore ce qu'il y a dans le document 5 que M. le coprocureur entend faire parvenir aux témoins, mais s'il s'agit des documents, des nouveaux documents qui ont été listés ce week-end par M. le coprocureur concernant un certain nombre d'articles de presse tels qu'il a été envoyé par mail, je tiens dès maintenant à indiquer que nous avons des objections à ces documents parce qu'un certain nombre d'entre eux ne figurent pas au case file ou en tout cas Parmi nos recherches, nous ne les avons pas trouvées avant que ces documents puissent être fournis à Monsieur le témoin. Je souhaiterais que l'on puisse en discuter s'il s'agit encore une fois des documents qui ont été listés par Monsieur le coprocureur pendant son week-end par email. Monsieur le Président, je comprends les observations entièrement. Ils ne sont pas à faire avec les emails de documents. Et j'espère que mon ami Fran sait que l'index de file 5, les documents vont devenir apparents, ils ne sont pas à faire avec les emails. Je pense que c'est un peu plus important que les emails de documents. Je pense que c'est un peu plus important que les emails de documents. Je pense que c'est un peu plus important que les emails de documents. Je pense que c'est un peu plus important. Mr. President, there was also a collection of other papers of Mr. Hedders from the files. Can I also hand those over? Mr. 
นอนุญาตให้ในรัฐบาลาคาตัวไอกษาแจ้งบุญฟ้าให้หนึ่งไอกษาบันไทมนี่ยกจูนสะสะใสพินิดังนั้นคุณควรจะมีไฟล์ของคุณอยู่ในห้องเรียนมากที่สุดและคำถามที่ผมจะถามคือเกี่ยวกับไฟล์2ดังนั้นคุณควรจะมีไฟล์ของคุณอยู่ในห้องเรียนมากที่สุดและคำถามที่ผมจะถามคือเกี่ยวกับไฟล์File two tab four. File two tab four. สำนวนมาอีกสามปี tab บุญ Document number E three slash five seven three. Our description on our case of this document, Mr. Heder, is a transcription of the shorthand notes of an interview by Stephen Heder with Ying Sri on the 4th of January 1999. Now, first of all, can you confirm that you took shorthand notes of the interview with Ying Sri? Yes. Chloe, but could you move to the channel? I want to move to an extract about halfway down the page, which states: Q Sampon became a central committee member 1976. Although already in 1975, he was de facto involved in central committee affairs. As chairman of 870, transfers and removals of cargo would cross his desk. He would be told, for example, that such and such was being sent to the chamber. So in some ways, he knew more than me. Close quote. Does that accurately record what Ying Sri told you about Q Sompon in this interview? Yes, I'm told that I may have misquoted the document number. Can I confirm for everyone it's E three slash five seven three? Mr. Heder, the extract that I just quoted and you've confirmed includes the words that such and such was being sent to the Chamka. What is or was the Chamka back in the days of democratic Cambodia? Well, Chamka is literally an agricultural field that's not for paddy, but for fruit or vegetables. So the implication on the face of it, the meaning on the face of it, is being sent to farm those kinds of fields, non-paddy agricultural fields. And if you're able to, Ing Sri was talking about Q Sampon's crossing his desk is the phrase of transfers and removals of cadre. Can I concentrate on the word removals? In all the interviews that you've conducted and from direct factual sources, without speculating and without offering an opinion, did the word removals have any particular connotation during the democratic Kampuchea period?
depending on context. Um, well, put it this way. Um, the literal meaning is precisely what's given here as a translation. The, the, what removal exactly meant was, I think, quite intentionally, quite intentionally left ambiguous by, by the terminology. So it might mean one thing, it might mean something else. That is to say, it might mean simply removal from the post, or it might mean removal from the post followed by something else. Was the term removal ever used in the context of an arrest? Yes. Among many other possibilities. When Ing Sari told you that Q Song Pon had been chairman of 870, was there any obvious doubt in the tone or the way he told you that Q Sampon was the chairman? No. Aside from talking about Q Sampon, having transfers and removals of cadre across his desk as chairman of 870. Did Ing Sari give any more detail as to the connection between Q Song Pong, Office 870, and what he did there? Um. Nothing more than is reflected here. Um, I'm going to be moving to separate files now, Mr. Heder. Can you put away our current file and please pick up file three? Mr. Header, file three, tab nine. Document number E190.1.72, at the top Steve Header interview with Van Rip, also known as Nguyen. 21st of March 2004, Saan, Kandal Province. First of all, Mr. Heder, just a, a very brief introduction as to how this interview with Van Rut was organized. Um, to use the journalistic phrase, I I simply appeared. I ascertained where he lived. I appeared at his residence and asked to speak. You should have within tab nine the transcribed uh, elements of the interview, and then behind that, can you confirm that you've got some handwritten notes? I think seven pages in total. Can you confirm if they are the handwritten notes that you made when you were speaking to Van Rutt? 
Yes. If we look on the typewritten version, which is the first page in your tab 9, it states as follows. Van Rutt confirms that Q Sompon was chairman of M870 after Duan. In that capacity, Van Rutt liaised with him on matters concerning commerce and requests for materials which would come from other central ministries through M870 to Van Rutt. He doesn't know what other aspects of central committee work Q Sompong might have handled, but Dr. does not deny that it could have included military and security affairs. Can you confirm that that is what Van Rutt told you in this interview? Yes. Dealing with the next paragraph, it's recorded in the following terms. When Q Sompong told him around July 1978 that the Central Committee wanted him to travel to the Northwest on commercial matters, he feared he was about to be arrested. Can you confirm that that is what Van Rutt told you in this interview? Yes. Turning to the next page, which takes us into English 0074760, French 0074418, and Khmer 0074278, and in connection with uh, 1978, there's the following extract. He, so that's Van Rick. He told Q Sampong in November 1978 that the revolution in the countryside was a failure, that there was no great leap forward, but in fact, starvation. Close quote. Again, can you confirm that that is what was said in this interview with Van Rutt? Yes. Next question. Without speculating, without giving opinion, relying on factual sources, whether from your interviews or otherwise. Have you seen factual material about Van Rick liaising with Q Sompong on commercial matters? Um. Possibly in some of the DC CAM interview materials, something like that or to that effect comes up. I'm trying to remember whether there might be something similar in any of the interviews that were done in 2005. And I, don't, I don't specifically recall what there was. There might have been, but I don't what there was. And have you ever seen any copy Ministry of Commerce documentation either mentioning Q Sompon, Hem, or if you like, it being apparent from the face of the document that it's a Ministry of Commerce document mentioning Hem or Q Sompon? Uh, yes, I saw at least some such documents um, when they were still on file at DC CAM, um, and more such documents uh, when I was working at, I believe, OCIJ, not OCP, but it could have been both places. Thank you. I'd like to move next, please, to file four.
file for tab four. These are extracts from the book <coughs> Seven <coughs> Candidates <coughs> for Prosecution. <coughs> I'd like you to go to the extract that reflects page 93, <coughs> which is, I think, the last page <coughs> in this <coughs> Do you have that page? It should have 93 in the top right. Yes, confirm Quote from this page. In particular, uh, and I should say this is referencing Q Sampong. In particular, it was in his capacity as chairman of Office 870 that Q Sampong was present as a note taker at a secret meeting in the first half of 1978 at which Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia and Son Sen ordered the purge and execution of East Secretary Sao Pim and most other leading CPK military and political cadre in the East Zone. Footnote 361 then references two documents, E3-1915, which is Nate Thayer Death in Detail in the Far Eastern Economic Review, and E3-1567, Nate Thayer Dutch Confesses, again, Far Eastern Economic Review. Certainly, Mr. President, the footnote in seven candidates is footnote 361. And the documents to support the footnote are E3-1915. And E three slash one five six seven. Question, Mr. Header, Nate Thayer. Look, little bit of detail, and can you help us on when it was that Nate Thayer was speaking to Dutch or Doik? A little bit of detail, not too much, please. Um, Nate Thayer was, is a journalist, um, had worked in Bangkok and in Phnom Penh, um, and particularly in Phnom Penh, um, sometime I think shortly after the beginning of the UNTAC period, through to the end of the 90s at least. Um, and was, I believe, the interview with Doik or the conversations with Doik, all of the conversations at which Nate was present were all in I think it's early 99, if I recall correctly, uh, sometimes in the presence of one or more persons from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Of the era. Uh, I think sometimes on his own. Thank you. Still within file 4, tab 4, so the very section that you have. But if you move backwards, please, to page 65. So this is document E3-48, seven candidates for prosecution, page 65, footnote 234. It's stated, Mr. Header, and this is reference to reports. These reports are sometimes addressed specifically to Pol Pot, including by abbreviation or by his alias 009. But more often, they are addressed simply to brother or the organization. 
or the Central Committee by its code number 870. But they were routinely stated to be copied to a list of recipients that included Nguyen Chia. More particularly, these reports were routinely marked for copying and presentation Cham Lan Chun to some or all of the five members of the Standing Committee who were usually resident in the capital, Phnom Penh. Pol Pot, referred to as Uncle, Nguyen Chia, referred to as Uncle Nguyen, Ng Sari, referred to as Brother Van, the late Von Vet, referred to as Brother Von, and the late Son Sen, referred to as Brother Kiel. And in footnote 234, you state, the list usually appears at the bottom of the document, and like the documents themselves, is usually typewritten. Starting in early 1978, Brother Kiev is often not on the list, apparently because he was on duty on the Vietnamese border. In addition to the specified members of the Standing Committee, the list also typically indicates that the documents were to be copied to the office and to documentation. Close quote. Now, Mr. Hedder, the question is, just approximately, how many reports of this nature have you seen? Just roughly. Um, if by reports we're referring in this context specifically to reports that were in fact telegrams, um, a dozen or two. Thank you. I'd like you please now to turn to file five. Mr. Header, file five probably indexes one and two together, or you may be answering questions selectively on them. But so that we have the two documents on the record, first of all, E3-724, a revolutionary youth from July 1975, and secondly, E3-731, a revolutionary flag special issue, December 1975 to January 1976. Mr. Hedder, in respect of revolutionary flags, the case file shows that contact was going to be made with you to provide two copies of revolutionary flag. First question is, did you provide copies of revolutionary flag having received requests from this court? Um, yes, at least revolutionary flag or flag and or revolutionary youth. I don't recall specifically. Now, if we take them together and call them revolutionary flags and youth, 
Can I ask when was the first time that you saw, and can you explain whether it was an original or a copy, but roughly what year was the first time you saw an original or a copy of revolutionary flag or revolutionary youth? Um, Certainly 1980, maybe 1979, um, but the first time I saw a collection of flags and youth, and youth, wasn't until, if I recall correctly, late 1980. Um, and I'm almost entirely certain that the ones that were asked for by the court and which I provided to the court came from that collection that I saw in late 1980. And they were among duplicates of those particular issues of flags and youth. Uh, that were lying around um, the dual slang genocide museum, that is to say, S21, XS21, were given to me by the archivists at the dual slang genocide museum. When you say duplicates, and if you can look, please, at tab one and tab two on the documents I've described, dealing first of all with tab one, which was E3-724. We can see that the version we have here on the front cover is in red, with two flags shown on the front in red. Can you please confirm that? Yes, and I'll, I'll clarify that when I say duplicates, I mean duplicates of the original. In those days, there, were, there was no, almost, there was not, almost no photocopy capacity in Phnom Penh. So the archivist's decision was they would give me copies of things of which of, they would give me originals of publications of which there were also other originals. So I only got originals. I didn't get any photocopies. I only got originals for which they also had additional originals. So when we see the if I can call it the physical state of each of the pages on this first document and indeed the second one and the state of the magazine as shown by the spine, the, these are the ones that you saw back then. Is that correct? Yes, I believe there were others but they came onto the case file by different routes. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, Mr. Council. Um, do I understand correctly that the witness is now being shown a color copy of the revolutionary flag? And if yes, I think it would be very helpful, especially um, for our client in the holding cell to be able to see the same color copy of the revolutionary flag that is just presented. So I would invite, like to invite prosecutors, if possible, to, to, to give that color copy. Yes, that certainly presents no problems. Can I explain? Uh, on the case file, E3-724 is in red, but we're going to have copies of both of these copied off and passed over to my learned friend. Mr. Header, can we look please first at the first tab, which is E3-724, and if I take you to the, the first page in after the cover, if that makes sense, and we can see in the 
top of the page, no, there's some handwriting in English. It's down the margin of that page and also at the top. Can I check that you're at tab one, which is the revolutionary flag with two flags on the front? Or let me give you the opportunity to, to go through this um, document. So this is the one with two revolutionary flags on the front. Well, that's the revolutionary youth from July 1975. But there's writing in English at various points in the document. Can you help on whose annotations or markings those are, in other words, whose handwriting. Um, yes, actually going back to the cover, the annotation that says 775 on the top right, that's me trying to make a chronological file of this particular source. The um, underlining in red with the flash translations in red, all of that is me. Um, I think maybe I eventually ran out of red ink. So, yes, the annotations further along in the document, the underlining, hmm. I'm not sure the, yeah, the underlining, the squiggle along the margin and the English annotations, all And the same question in respect to tab two. So this is the revolutionary flag. And again, if you look on the front page, there's some markings in red pen. And then as we go through the document again, there's some markings both on the pages themselves and in the margins. Yes, again. The, the added date on the front cover and the underlining squiggling and annotations along the side and within the text are all me. Thank you. Can I just explain to everyone in court that the first document that I've been calling E3-724, the red color we understand is E169 slash 4.1.1 and the second document I've been referring to E3 slash 731 the red version is E169 slash 4 slash 1.1.2 Thank you, Mr. Hedder. I'd like you now to turn to tab three within the same file. Briefly, Mr. President, May just to come back to my early point today. Um, um, it's very difficult for me to catch up with the question if I don't have the document on, on the screen. Um, it's especially difficult, uh, of course, for my client to follow. So it's not necessarily uh, the point that I, or that we are seeing it, it's the point that on the screen, um, uh, the down the whole so is able to see a colored version of the revolutionary flag. You know, uh, the trial chairman knows, Mr. President, is the issue of, um, of discussion. So we're going very quickly now through a document, and I have no idea, to be honest, which notes um, were referred to just now. So I would like to ask the prosecution to slow down on this and use this opportunity 
Mr. President, I agree with that suggestion. Can we please have up on the screen the first of the documents I've been referring to? That is E169 slash 4 slash 1 point 1 point 1. It's on the screen. I understand that's on the screen. Mr. Header, to take this simply referencing an earlier question and answer, you said that you had written 7 stroke 7 5 on the front page. Is that correct? Yes. And if I can please ask for the very next page to come up on the screen. There we have some English words written on the Khmer text in the margin and at the top of the page. And we have some underlining as well. And your answer was that this was in your handwriting. Is that correct? Yes. Can I ask, please, at this page, so this is the first page after the front page is put up on the screen so that everyone can see this page. It's not, it's not being shown on the screen. Yeah. Mr. President, can the AV unit be instructed to put up on the screen? ERN Mr. President, I understand this is being sorted out with the AV unit. Can I give the ERN number again to help? This is a Khmer page and it is at ERN number 008 Mr. President, that is now up on the screen. Mr. Look Header, is it on your screen? And again, just to confirm, there is some writing on the top of the page and in the margin in red pen and some underlining on the document itself. Can you confirm that that was in your handwriting? Yes. I want to move to the second document which is behind your tab two. This is document number E169, stroke four, stroke one, point one, point two. And I'd like the first page to be shown. The command ERN is 0, 0, 8, 0, 
that is now up on the screen, on the screen rather. Mr. Header, on this document in the top, there is written in pen 12 stroke 7 5 dash 1 stroke 7 6. Is that in your handwriting? Yes. The next page I'd like the AV unit to bring up is Khmer ERN 0098829. We now have that page, and again, there is some writing on the body of the document, some writing in the margin of the document, and some underlining on the document itself. Can you confirm if that is in your handwriting? Uh, yes, again. And, Mr. Hedder, where are the hard copy originals of these documents? Can you help? Um, my recollection is that I gave them to the yeah, Thank you very much. Now, I'd like to go next, please, Some to tab three. The document at tab three is E3 slash 25. It is a revolutionary flag special issue, December 1976 to January 1977. I would like this to be shown in Khmer, please, so can I give the Khmer ERN first? Khmer, 000. Six three zero three nine English it's an extract, Mr. Hedder. Can you confirm you have it with a page with a heading of attacking the enemy politically? And this is on page 31 in the English, and I've given the Khmer reference. Can the AV unit show, please, the page in Khmer, 000, 000, 63039? Mr. Hedder, can you confirm for me, at least, that you've got the English of this page with a heading attacking the enemy politically? I've deliberately yes. given you a full version of the Khmer because I know often there some words can need elaborating. But I'm going to read the whole of this section. Attacking the enemy politically, taking just one example, fighting to seize the people. Throughout the world, they never fought to seize the people. Our line was to fight to seize the people. One, we took him. Two, we took them. One hundred, we took them. One thousand, we took them. And so on, until we fought for and seized the people from Phnom Penh too. 
the line of drying up the people from the enemy was very correct. This never happened in the world. When the enemy has the people, the enemy has a military and an economy. When the enemy has no people, the enemy has no military and no economic strength. Our reasoning is correct. Thus, our line is very correct. We fight to seize the people at every location. An example. The fighting in Banam in 1973, we took everyone in Banam town, expelling the ethnic Vietnamese, the ethnic Chinese, the military, the police. We took everyone, drying up the people from the enemy. And at the end of the next, uh, sorry, halfway through the next paragraph talks about the phrase, because we pulled out the people, when all the people were pulled out, they gained no additional forces. And at the last sentence of that paragraph, the decisive factor in the victory, we pulled out the people. An example, we liberated Udong in 1974, we pulled out all the people, and at the bottom bottom of the extract, this is a very important strategic line, control the people and seize the people, close quote. Mr. Hedder, um, first of all, you've already testified about the phrase drying up the people from the enemy. But here we have the, set, the phrases seizing the people and pulling out the people. Based on factual information, your interviews or other direct factual sources without speculating and without offering opinion, is there other factual documentation talking of or interviews referencing the phrases seizing the people or pulling out the people? Uh, yes. There is reference in this document to fighting in Banam Town. I don't know where this is. You said you arrived in September 1973. Again, based on factual sources, without offering opinion and without speculating, uh, is there factual information about um, drying up the people in Banam in 1973 from sources other than the documents we are now looking at? Um, not that I'm immediately aware of, no. Not in my files, in other words. Not in my files. In terms of my earlier question about factual information on the phrase seizing or pulling out the people, your answer was yes. Can you tell us in what sort of documents there is factual information about seizing the people or pulling out the people? Um, May I deal with the translation issue in this context? Yes. Um, the pulling out one is straightforward. That's the same Khmer term as removal that we encountered in another context. So this is an example of removal that doesn't necessarily mean um, The term that's translated here is seizing. I was sitting here thinking, I've been trying to figure out a way to translate this word for 40 years and still don't have the answer. Uh, I can only give you an example that gives you a sense. Um, this is the, the verb that's used to describe, for example, two children fighting over a piece of candy. And the one who gets the piece of candy is the one who seizes, to use this phrase, the candy. Or alternatively, as in this context, Two armies or two political administrations fighting for 
Administrative control over people or it could also be used to refer to territory. And to anticipate down to the very last line in the bits that are boxed in the red in the English. Uh, that's the same seize the people I'm talking about. This is a very important strategic line. Control the people and seize the people. So that's the same seize. I have a bit of a problem with the translation of the, uh, uh, the translation of the term that's been compared into the English word control. Um, this is a word that literally means, the literal meaning of this word is grasp. Um, it has a variety of meanings depending on context. It can mean literally grasp, that is having a hand. It was also used to mean to grasp in the intellectual sense. ปราบเปียกถ้าเราปราบในกรอบปราบโดยตามปัญญาสมารดัยแต่มาดองกรอบปราบตามระยะคู่กบาลหรือมองยืนโดยเฉียมเมียเทียนโยบายกรอบปรา
Thank you. I'd like you to please to turn to page six on your document. This is English ERN 0058382 from 0084. The Khmer ERN is 0038 and the French is 0078. Eight, three, five, six, and there's this quote. Later on, and I should say this is referencing Hu Yuan's speech, so page six of your document at the bottom. Later on, the organization implemented a plan according to the slogan of the first phase, attack the countryside, surround the city, which was the second phase. The implementation of the plan achieved considerable success, hence in 1971, the organization decided to oblige all of its military cadres to leave Vietnam's military units by shifting to self-reliance. My question, Mr. Hedder, is, based on factual information with the usual caveat, is there other factual reference to a plan which has two phases, phase one, attack the countryside, and phase two, surround the city? Um, this, this kind of formulation is classic in Chinese Communist thought and Vietnamese Communist thought that said immediately off the top of my head, I don't recall a specific reference in CPK materials to this, but I wouldn't be surprised Alright, thank you. Tab 5, please. We're moving now to document number E3-118. The English ERN is 00166994. The French is 0084585455. Through five five. And the Khmer is 00846160. And this is a FIBIS document for April 1975. The extract relates to the heading, Hugh Sompong, 21st April Victory Message on Phnom Penh Radio. The Phnom Penh Domestic Service in Cambodia on the 21st of April. And it's a congratulatory statement by the RGNUC Deputy Prime Minister Minister of National Defence and CPNLAF Commander in Chief Q Sampong to CPNLAF units and Cambodian people live or recorded. The third paragraph quoting the speech is in the following terms, and I quote. This is our nation's and people's greatest historic victory. Our entire nation, people, and CPNLAF, as well as people throughout the world, and in all friendly countries far and near, warmly welcome this great victory. It has opened the most brilliant and righteous path which led the Cambodian people and the CPNLAF in waging the powerful people's war to fight the enemy on every field, military, political, economic, and in its efforts to drain the population from control areas, successively smashing all enemy maneuvers, relentlessly attacking and draining 
meaning of the enemy, of its military, political, economic and financial strength, food and rice, until it reached a point from which it could not recover. Finally, the enemy died in agony. Mr. Head of the first question, we know that you left Phnom Penh before this date of the 21st of April 1975, but did you hear this broadcast around about this time, or when is the first time that you saw factual documentation referencing this broadcast by Q. Sampong? Um, this broadcast wouldn't have been easily audible to me where I was on the 21st of April 1975, um, but the same process of distribution of FIBIS materials that I described previously um, is also applicable to the U.S. Embassy in Bangkok. They received, as a matter of course, all the same blue teletype. Um, translations by FIBIS of such broadcasts, and I did, having done that, having done, having followed the, those blue teletypes in Phnom Penh, I also followed them in Bangkok, so I, 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 I think it's highly likely I saw this in the blue teletype version in Bangkok in April 1975. I was going to cover this later, but I think it's convenient to cover it now. The archive rat in Phnom Penh continues to be the archive rat in Bangkok, is that correct? Um, yes. Explain to us, not the life story, can you explain to us where you went I think you said you left Phnom Penh on the 11th of April, is that correct, or was it another day? Yes. Can you take us from the 11th of April 1975, let's say to the end of 1975, where were you and what sort of interest did you continue to have in what was going on in democratic Kampuchea and how did you access sources of information during that period? Um, I flew out on the 11th of April 1975 in the morning um, with a plan to return to Phnom Penh, a plan which turned out not to be possible to implement. Um, so I was, as it were, stranded in Bangkok. Um, went from Bangkok to the Thai-Cambodian border, probably arrived on the Thai-Cambodian border on or about the 17th, because by the 15th of April it was clear that um, it wasn't going to be possible to fly back into Phnom Penh. Um, did some interviewing of people coming out to the Thai side, until sometime in May, if I recall correctly, at which point I went to Laos and did reporting from Laos for a couple of months. Um, and then from Laos, I went to Taiwan towards the middle of the year, latter half of of, of, of 1975, spent a couple of months reporting from Taiwan and also doing some Chinese study. And from there I went um, back to Cornell where I'd done my BA uh, to pursue a higher level degree in what Cornell called government, which is a kind of political science course. That would have been, I would have arrived in Ithaca and Cornell in September 75. If I call that the back to Cornell period now, September 75 onwards, you're at Cornell. Can you just explain and 
move us into 76 or 77 or whatever years we're in. But how are you accessing information about democratic Cambodia? Um, academic articles, newspaper reporting, radio. Can you give us some flavour as to how you continue your contact at Cornell? With issues um, I mean the, the, the preface to that the answer to that question is with great difficulty um, it was possible to access the Yellow Daily Report version of FBIS, which was deposited in the Cornell Library. And the Cornell Library in those days also ran a very comprehensive newspaper clipping service focused on Asia, Southeast Asia in particular. At a special part of the library that did only that. So I was able to follow the media reports. Um, I had some contact with journalist friends who were reporting on Cambodia out of Thailand, the American Embassy in Thailand. I also had some contact with former or current. U.S. government officials, uh, either in Thailand or in Washington, who um, were involved in Cambodia affairs, so there was some information coming from them. And then um, I talked at length to the delegation of American Communist Party Marxist-Leninist uh, journalists who went to Cambodia in, I believe, the middle of 78. Um, I was in contact with Elizabeth Becker and Richard Dud Dudman, who went to Cambodia at the end of 78. And also in late 78, I had my first direct contact with Democratic Kampuchea officials, um, including Ian Sari, um, who came to the United States, came to, to New York City to attend a UN General Assembly meeting, I think it was. Uh, he was accompanied by a number of people from his ministry, including Imlon alias Not with whom I joked about the fact that he had shelled my home in 1974. Um, and part of the purpose of those uh, meetings or encounters or discussions was to arrange for me and a number of others, um, journalists, scholars, to go to Democratic Kampuchea. Uh, and the, that trip was scheduled to occur in early 1979. Um, however, um, the delegation um, got to Beijing at a point after which the large-scale Vietnamese invasion had already been launched. We discussed the situation with the then Democratic Kampuchea ambassador in Beijing, about whom I spoke to you previously, Pictian alias To, um, and he explained to us that the Vietnamese were attempting to take Phnom Penh um, and that we would have to wait a little while uh, until democratic Cambodia threw the Vietnamese out of Cambodia. Um, that little while turned out to be um, basically uh, never happened in some ways. Um, they didn't throw them out. So from there, from Beijing, I went to Bangkok, from Bangkok back to the Thai Cambodian border, and we've already briefly discussed my uh, rather foolish little trips into. Democratic Cambodia at the very tail end and just after the tail end of the regime in January 1979. In that answer, you mentioned In Lawn, alias Nat. Who was he? What was his job? What happened to him? He was 
a leading cadre of one of the divisions that operated out of the special zone. That was the capacity in which he or his forces shelled the southwest part of Phnom Penh in 74. Uh, he then came to Phnom Penh and was the original chairman of S-21. Uh, after that, he took up another post in the general staff under Sun Sen. And then in the latter part of 1978, he was transferred along with a number of other general staff, high-ranking cadre, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and like most, if not all of them, um, was purged since S-21 at the very end of 78 or very beginning of 79. I'd like you to look at file 5. I'd like you to go, though, to the index to file 5 that is at the front. And you'll see there at items 6 through to 11, there is reference to a number of Nouvelles du Cambodge magazines or publications. And I wonder, first of all, please, if I could take you to um, number six, so tab six. This is document number E3-1238. And Mr. Heller, can you confirm that you've got this in English and French? In terms of the French version, we have the, the title Nouvelle du Cambodge. We're obviously back in this document, E3-1238, to late March in 19. 74, going into April. And on the front page in the English, please, can I take you to? This is English RN 00278739. And it's a message delivered on the 27th of March from Norodom Sihanouk. Uh, of congratulations to Kyu Sampong on the official friendly visit to Vietnam. And the text simply reads, I am extremely happy to learn that you have arrived in good health in the glorious and fraternal Democratic Republic of Vietnam. And to deliver to you and their excellencies, Yim Sari, Kyu Tirit, and my heartfelt wishes for a complete success in your patriotic mission, your current and future visits to our friends, Vietnam, China, and Korea. Now, Mr. Hedder, I want to ask you about at the time now. So this is back at the time in late March, early April. Can you remember whether from Nouvelle du Cambodge or other sources, this delegation led by Q Sompon and Ying Sari going on an official visit to a number of countries. Uh, yes, from the blue teletype Fibus file in the U.S. Embassy in Phnom Penh. I'm not going to go through every document because we don't have time, but can I take you please to index, sorry, to tab 9, so the same folder but tab 9. Tab 9 references in uh, document number E3-114. The page I'd like to go to is your page, page 7 in English. That then gives English ERN 00280556, French 00000000. Nine three through nine four and Khmer zero zero six six two two five eight. There is an extract which reads as follows. It's under a heading. The Phnom Penh traitors are in total disarray and are cornered on the defensive on all fronts. 
There's an extract and I quote. But when they were exposed in Phnom Penh, FAPLNK launched on an assault on the 14th of March against positions on the Kodak Islands and Ochnatay on the Mekong River six kilometers from the Royal Palace, Phnom Penh. In one day and one night, they liberated the islands, wiped out an enemy battalion, and helped 50,000 people to cross over to the liberated zone. Mr. Heder, my question is, at the time, back around the 14th of March, 1974, can you remember um, incidents at Kodak Islands and Ochnate on the Mekong River, on the same page, we continue. A day later, on March the 15th, FAPLNK again launched a swift and surprise attack on the city of Udon. On the 18th of March, it says 1874, Udong was totally liberated. An enemy division was totally wiped out, and 30,000 inhabitants of that town and surrounding areas successfully crossed over to the liberated zone. It is only after FAPLNK had totally destroyed the military position, the administrative power, detention camps, the pacification centers at Udong, that the traitors rushed reinforcement troops to recapture the town of Udong, but they too were totally trounced and decimated in great numbers. The first question relates to what size, if you, if you knew at the time, of Khmer Republic troops were present in Udong prior to the Khmer region attack. This suggests a, uh, an enemy division was wiped out. Was that in accordance with direct factual information you had at the time or that you um, read shortly afterwards? Um, I, I can't say that I knew the, the thank, that is, Khmer Republic order of battle uh, for that particular location. Um, I can say that when comparing these radio broadcasts or these transmissions, some of these are teletype transmissions, not radio broadcasts, um, with what I, either I saw on, on the ground or I was told by others who were on the ground, military attaches and the like. The numbers were in, in, some of the events that are described in these um, radio broadcasts or teletype transmissions either never occurred or include highly inflated numbers. The latter part of the quote referred to detention camps. Now, you probably don't remember, but on day one when we were going through Cambodian communism, there was a footnote, I think 83, that referred to a US um, CIA report about a detention camp near Siem Reap. Now, can you help us again, based on factual information, without speculating and without giving opinion evidence, can you say from factual sources what the prevalence was, if any, of detention camps prior to 1975? Well, the, the Khmer Republic continued to operate prisons 
and police lockups in Phnom Penh and other provincial towns. There were also occasionally um, ad hoc military detention facilities um, in places outside of Phnom Penh and, and provincial towns. Uh, but I think my recollection is the latter were relatively rare. Thank you. Tab 10, please, within the same file. ដំណាងសហរដ្ឋអាមេរិកាអនុលេខ <coughs> ອັນຈະພົດສະໃສຮູບນີ້ໂດຍຊ្នេះອົງຈຳແນກສໍາລັບດອນເປີວິລີຕາມສໍານາສົມຂອງດໍານາງ <coughs> ຫນ່ວຍຈຶ່ງກໍຕະຫຼອບມາກັນກະໄລພະດອນໄດ້ຄັມໃນ